thanks, Stephen. Uh, and definitely happy to kind of hang out with all of you and kind of um, you know participate today. So. Um, my name is uh, Nick. Uh, I actually live out here over in uh, San Francisco, California, and you know I, I got into crypto uh, quite a, quite a bit ago. You know, bought with buying bitcoins. You know, probably uh, I think around 2013, and you know I saw the collapse of MT Gox. I thought crypto was a giant scam, and you know I pretty much turned my back on it ever since. And uh, you know back in uh, I think DeFi summer kicked off and really kind of reignited like a uh, you know a big passion and love for the space. So kind of uh, dived on head deep into DeFi summer and, uh, you know, started to, you know, create content on TikTok. And so actually you go ahead and you can actually find most of my my content here on uh, on TikTok. And, you know, it's funny enough, Steven, I think one of my most popular TikToks is from the earliest days of Wonderland where I was showing everyone your calculator and, and I put a link in my bio to it. I think it was one of my most popular click-through links. So <laughs> I don't I don't know to be uh, if I should be flattered or, or horrified every time I hear Wonderland now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get a little bit of PTSD. It was, you know, the the heydays of DeFi summer. It was it was surreal. No matter what you threw money at, it just kept going up at a, a, an obscene APR or APY. Uh, those those were the days. From yeah, I mean, every fork, every farm. Think, Go ahead. No, no, yeah, I, I thought I heard maybe McDavid trying to speak there. Uh, I was trying to see if his audio was fixed. I don't think so. I think we have a few. Um, oh few other people who who might have their uh video or not video but their microphones on right now uh, which may be getting some some background noise so let me see mcdavid is not muted so he should be able to talk but we're not getting any sound from him unfortunately also crypto nick if you want to post your, the link to your tiktok in the uh, description go ahead and and do that before we before we start talking DeFi. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, what is that? Just like the general chat, then I guess. Or uh, so a, the yeah, the chat. If you go to the right top right corner of um, oh, I, can, I see it. Yeah. Oh my god. I'll, I'll teach you Discord. Discord. You teach me TikTok. Right now. <laughs> okay, that's, that's me with TikTok. <laughs> Don't worry. There you go. I'll just put a. It's kind of like a link tree. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Thanks again. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Um, so let's just get started. If uh, if you know if McDavid can get in, that'd be fantastic. If you guys don't know, uh, McDavid works with Aperture as well as Hamora now. Uh, Aperture is working with Hamora to do some some great PDN vaults. If you don't know what PDN is, it's pseudo delta neutral. Uh, we had a high interest in pseudo delta neutral about a year ago when we first when you know, I say we when I first figured out how to how to do them, um, utilizing like Francium and Tulip. People were doing them before that, uh, but that's sort of when I was exposed to them. And oh, we're getting a little bit of sound from McDavid. Uh, maybe he's in here, but you, just you know, hear me drop my laptop. <laughs> oh jeez, uh, you're in here. Yeah. Uh, glad you can make it. So anyways, pseudo delta neutral vaults were really interesting. However, when the bear market hit, we realized that impermanent loss is a real thing uh, and it sort of sucks and it can hurt PDN vaults. So after that, the PDN technology has has advanced dramatically where automatically rebalancing vaults sort of made PDN interesting again. Uh, now we saw attempts and failed attempts to do this. And, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but certainly people tried to do PDN vaults and, and those PDN vaults ran pretty substantial net losses for their investors. Uh, but then we saw some outliers that, you know, I'll name RoboVault as one of them, that uh, although the yields aren't super interesting, uh, they have done incredibly well with their PDN vaults. And uh, Scion as well. Now, I can't I can't vouch for Scion too much because I haven't done enough research to say like how safe their smart contracts are, but their actual returns have been really interesting and they're also in that PDN space. So as technology evolves, hey Greg, I'm gonna go ahead and mute you. Uh, as technology evolves and as people and uh, systems and hedging gets better, I do look forward to the future of PDN and I do think that uh, Homora and Aperture are sort of at the cutting edge of that. Um, you know, you guys arguably being the the first successful PDN vaults with your, your Aperture automated uh, you know, mirror slash anchor strategy. So thanks for joining us. Just gave you a little bit of an introduction. If you would yeah, like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you want to continue on your introduction, please, please go ahead. Tell people who you are. That was a pretty solid intro. Um, a little, I guess a little more context on Aperture. So yeah, this sort of like pseudo delta neutral space has been our bread and butter thus so far. Um, the team has a very technical background. Um, it's a couple of engineers who met at Google um, and decided to start automating some DeFi strategies. And um, yeah, I think 
the thing that's helped us build these successful vaults is the technical ability to pull off these like somewhat complex on-chain rebalancers, um, which is kind of the the secret to um, the pseudo delta neutral part of these vaults. Um, but yeah, that's what Aperture, what we've kind of hung our hat on so far. I can share a little bit of alpha um, later in the call about what might be on the horizon for Aperture. I mean, our goal is to have um, a variety of these like so-called structured products that can perform in um, a variety of different market conditions. So happy to talk about that a little bit more later on as well. But yeah, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Uh, so since I have, I mean, I don't know, some pretty robust power users in DeFi here. Uh, Mar, I don't know if you're going to be able to talk because I know it's, it's, it's late where you are, but uh, maybe you can even chime in on some of these questions. I want to talk about the state of DeFi. You know, have this be a little bit about a little bit of a DeFi hangout. By the way, um, while we're doing this, McDavid, do you want to go over sort of the uh, what you guys are doing today as, as, a, as a giveaway? So I know you mentioned the giveaway. I don't know the exact details, but if you mention it and you tell it, then maybe the community will uh, will understand better. Yeah, basically uh, any quality questions or comments or hot takes in the, the chat bar, or you can raise your hand and talk verbally. That counts as well. But yeah, any any quality hot takes there we're gonna airdrop 100 usdc you'll just um i'll dm you on on discord after the call is over um and we'll do up to 10 um so it kind of depends Ooh. on we want to give it all away but <laughs> if we only get like six that seem what worthy well then it'll just be six but hopefully we get 10 all right so i think hope that will incentivize some hot takes throughout this uh this conversation so let's let's jump right in right um so crypto nick i want to get some of your your takes on on DeFi this year so we've experienced a, a bit of volatility in 2022 some people might be able to argue uh just very broadly how do you think 2023 is going to go and what do you find to be the most compelling narratives moving forward for sure. No, no, I appreciate the question. Yeah, I mean, 2022 was, uh, you're really right, it was such a unique year. Uh, there was definitely a lot going on. And, you know, for unfortunately, it's been kind of a, a down only year. So it hasn't really been uh, the most exciting time to be really in DeFi. Uh, I think when you look at some of these uh, projects, you're seeing a lot of the old narratives that used to stick, um, you know, especially so many things surrounding like high inflationary farm tokens are starting to fade, right? People are starting to find safe haven and other kind of other risk asset classes. Um, you know, for example, uh, I bonds, right? I bonds is never an exciting thing to talk about when you're a crypto native, but you know, when they're paying eight, nine percent versus some stablecoin farms, the things start to look pretty attractive. So, I think as we kind of approach 2023, I think I think a lot of uh, projects are really starting to figure figure this out, right? About what makes um, a, pe a compelling use case for out when when token, right? When actually is a token useful? You know, finding product market fit first, which I think is probably more importantly, and finding teams who you know, are just are really dedicated on building throughout this bear market that are trying to find adoption and traction for the product to, you know, kind of serve serve the biggest audience they can rather than kind of just maybe hopping on the latest trend, which is what I think, you know, 2021 was all about per se, uh, you know, trying to fork a project and deliver as fast as possible. So, you know, one of the big narratives I think is going to be real yield. I think everyone's probably familiar, of course, with like GMX, GNS, things like that, um, as well as I think options. I think options is going to be a big one. I think a lot of people are, are trying to figure out that best with like Premiere and Dopex and some projects. So, I mean, I'll stop there for a moment, but I think it's kind of just like a quick take. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great quick take. Um, those are definitely protocols that that I would say are, are leading the pack right now. Uh, one of the other things you mentioned was was like the the I bonds, and on that note, when do you feel? I mean, if you have a take on this, when when and who is going to bring I bonds into on chain onto DeFi? I mean, we have like synthetic versions of stocks now. We have synthetic versions of options. We have so many financial derivatives uh, coming on to DeFi, why not bonds? When are we going to have these more robust, more like yield bearing assets? I mean, imagine if you could just like take an I bond, you know, or a treasury bill and collateralize it and like, you know, borrow some stables against it and loop that opportunity. How cool would that be? Uh, you know, clearly it's a bit degen, but, but why not? Is that not the future of DeFi? What do you think? No, I, I think that's I think where, where... <laughs> oh, please. Yeah, go ahead. You first. Um, I've actually brought this up as an idea, like maybe like six months ago at Aperture. Um, and just, I, I kind of want to also sidebar, use my take here as sort of the inside perspective of a protocol Me in too. DeFi and how we think about like which vaults 
get made or not because aperture you know really the sky is the limit on what we've talked about building um so we kind of have some insights there into how these things do get greenlit internally to be built or to raise money to build them um and specifically for that idea steven i think the biggest thing is regulation um people are pretty uh scared to I mean, Mirror was a really early example of like something that pissed off the SEC. Um, and even this wasn't really talked about that much, but TFL like basically abandoned Mirror like after that whole incident happened. The, the team that was running Mirror, it was super decentralized. They had like a skeleton crew running it. Um, and they tried to do their best to like distance themselves from that protocol. So it was like, hey, this is this decentralized thing. We don't really have control over it. Right. Um, and, and that was just because they, you know, the, the fear of the SEC, and that's basically what would prevent people from doing what would be a really sick strategy, which is to take these great risk-free interest rates you get in TradFi from the U.S. government um, and, like, put them on chain. Because, like, to your point, Stephen, there's so many, like, amazing strategies that could come out of that. But, yeah, basically, thus far, I don't think anyone's figured out a way to do that without directly running head-on into, like, securities law issues. Right. I mean, I, I 100% respect and understand that that point, but I've heard the same argument be made about what Gaines is doing, right? So, I mean, by by all accounts, what Gaines is doing is completely illegal uh, with their synthetic stocks, or sorry, with their synthetic Forex. Um, and why aren't they, I mean, you know, wh- why they are aren't afraid is a totally different issue, uh, but could not a completely decentralized protocol then bring synthetic assets that, that are like you said, maybe illegal or completely breaking regulatory uh, rules, um, you know, on chain. I would still be sort of interested, and maybe that's just my own personal risk reward. Uh, but you know, I'm not in DeFi because I want the safest, most regulated assets coming on here and, and, and being fun and composable. I like DeFi because it is a little bit riskier. It it does sort of walk that line between what is like what is and isn't allowed. Um, so. I hope that someone does it regardless of regulation. And don't quote me on that. Well, when I think you you look at these different teams, you know, GMX is a perfect example of this. And, you know, they're a, a completely anonymous team, right? And I think mm-hmm. they, they stay anonymous because of maybe some perhaps regulatory concerns. And, you know, I agree with you, Stephen, which is like there is probably a team out there that, you know, maybe looking at it, I think ultimately comes to, you know, the founder's first profile. I think they, they definitely could offer it. And, you know, when you take a look at GNS, you know, who knows, maybe they're looking at GNS and they're saying, you know, it's not big enough for us to care or not, you know, who knows? Um, you know, we saw, you know, for example, let's take a look at BlockFi, you know, who settled with the SEC, you know, I think they already had eight to $10 billion under assets under management before, you know, they even made that settlement. So it could also be a, just like, is it worth their attention at the moment? Yeah. I mean, let's hope that's the case. They're, they're just waiting to, they're waiting to rug us all. Um, <laughs> who knows? Yeah, hopefully not. But yeah, <laughs> hopefully not. That's right. So, okay, looking back at at, uh, at and and Mara. By the way, if you ever want to jump in, feel free. You're always invited to talk because um, I know you also have uh, have some takes on this. Looking back at 2021, what 2022? Gosh, we've gone so far. Uh, what were some of the standout protocols aside from, let's say, GMX and Gains that that you think may have changed the game a bit? So, from when you first got into DeFi until now, who were the game changers? That is definitely interesting. I mean, honestly, like, you know, obviously we have Aperture here. I mean, I, I think that in itself is very interesting. I think I, you know, I'll, I'll talk about some other protocols, but I did want to highlight Aperture because, you know, obviously McDavid is here and maybe you can chime in on this. But, um, you know, 2022, like, it's been a down only year. So finding these Delta Neutral strategies actually have been uh, kind of a breath of fresh air or a game changer um, in trying to, you know, get, get exposure somewhat slightly to the market and just an opportunity to earn yield, right, without taking on enormous risk. And so, uh, you know, product projects specifically like Aperture are definitely very interesting. Um, in terms of other ones, uh, give me a quick moment. Let me think. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you want to comment me, David, but uh, I'm going to build a list here real quick in my head. So, you know, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, the question being, like, what sort of, other DeFi opportunities seem interesting. No, no, no. The question it, was which which protocols or tokenomic types were, in your opinion, the most revolutionary uh, in DeFi in 2022. And you can it can be like 2022 and before. So if there were some things that came out, you know, prior to that, but you still think like these were the biggest milestones that DeFi has seen, uh, I'd love to hear mentioned. 
Well, 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 McDavid and and Nick are thinking. I, I, to, to me, one of them, and I think something we've been talking about a ton in the DeFi dojo is, you know, uh, liquid staking derivatives. Um, I think that, you know, the whole move from uh, proof of work to proof of stake, you know, has has in the kind of increased focus on that. I think has been huge, and I think, you know, as as many people know, there was a huge amount of you know, locked up capital um, and and a huge amount of potential growth that DeFi could go through by unlocking that. And I think we've seen some really uh, innovative work being done. You know, Lido is obviously the biggest one, but there's other, you know, competitors in the space now as well, like um, Rocket Pool and Frax is now there as well. Stator, um, Stride, Quicksilver, there's, there's a lot of them and, and other ones too, like Metapool. So I think you know, that's been been super interesting. And I also think that that's going to be a continuing narrative um, into 2023. I think that we're going to see, uh, you know, this kind of friction starting to happen where a lot of these liquid staking protocols need to get more complex because they're going to control more and more of the total supply of, of different tokens, whether it be ETH or Atom or NIR or whatever, whatever um, you know, layer one blockchain. And so I think that, you know, we're going to, we're kind of going to see uh, the next evolution of that and in increasing composability as well, which I think will be very interesting. Um, and m- maybe we'll get to a place where, you know, it will be the standard where having a staked version of an asset will just be the standard to hold instead of having the native asset itself. Um, and, and of course, also, you know, with with uh, the next ETH update coming coming on and like the beacon chain staked ETH, uh, you know, hopefully getting unlocked sometime maybe in March or, or Q1 or Q2 of next year, I think that will also really change the space as well um, in terms of like these assets going back to PEG, which I think will increase confidence in them as well, um, specifically talking about like stake ETH there. And then another thing which which I think is going to be super interesting in 2023 is, you know, these these structured products, you know, that's kind of getting back to, uh, you know, Aperture and what McDavid was saying. I think that that's going to have a heyday next year. Um, you know, it's, we've already seen a lot of kind of compelling uh, offerings, uh, as you said, in the interest, even there's been, you know, some problems with, with different ones of them with, you know, the ability to rebalance. But I think, uh, you know, adding these higher levels of complexity to these structured products, making them being more and more compelling. And I think it'll also bring in a lot new u- a lot of new users. I think, you know, for, for some kind of DeFi power users, there's uh, some concerns with using them. But I think that over time, they'll get better. And I think that'll bring you know, more and more people into the space when they can go in and get, you know, a compelling yield in USDC or or some, you know, blue chip, uh, uh, you know, DeFi token or a coin that they want to have, um, you know, yield on. So I think hopefully liquid staking will continue to be very strong narrative as well as these structured products as well. Yeah, you've mentioned uh, some things that, that you and I have talked about before, which is like, is there a future in which liquid staked assets become the norm? Like, why would you hold ETH when you could hold like wrap staked ETH? It's just ETH that gains in value, you know, four to five percent intrinsically year over year. Uh, of course, once once Shanghai upgrade is is finished, um, I'd like to actually get get McDavid's opinion and his and Nick's opinion as well on that. Do you think these interest bearing assets, you know? S AVAX as an example, S wrapped ST ETH as an example, uh, BNBX as an example, maybe B ETH. Do you think that these assets are the future of DeFi, or do you still think that there's sort of these fringe assets that only uh, DeFi users are going to care about, and then crypto mainstream is still going to widely ignore moving forward? Uh, yeah, so I guess I can start here. Yeah, I, I think when you look, talk about the overall like liquid staking derivative projects, I, I I expect them to gain adoption. And what I mean by that is, I think when you look at other proof of stake networks, uh, I'll pick on Avalanche for example, they have something like sixty percent uh, staked already. And I think when you look at Ethereum, I think the only uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's like twelve, thirteen percent of circulating supply of of all ETH staked. And I think that ultimately came down to two reasons. One is when people first staked their ETH, they didn't really have a certainty of when it would even be unlocked. So you probably don't have a lot of traction there from users. Um, additionally, right, we've seen a lot of new, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, a lot of new like improvements in the like last few months, right? We have Fraxit, which is kind of gaining exponential adoption. We have things like uh, Coinbase Each, which has come out. Uh, and so I think what you'll see is more and more uh, adoption of these stakes because like you said, it doesn't really make sense to hold an asset that's kind of where you could be earning free staking rewards and not really taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, and if I had to guess, the reason why more people weren't at the moment is simply just, you know, fear of the unknown. 
will the Shanghai upgrade go through? Will I be able to withdraw my ETH? Um, and then ultimately, uh, right, we just went through a massive debacle where um, Bido staked ETH, right, went through a whole depegging scenario, which of course might again cause some uncertainty with people. So I think as like all these things start to balance out, uh, things start to you know look upwards in 2023. I think you'll see a lot more adoption from that perspective, and and I kind of would almost assume that it would become a new norm, or at least like you would see things like money markets and maybe other vaults accept it as collateral and allow you to like leverage it even more. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's my, my take. Thanks. Uh, do McDavid, do, do, <clears throat> McDavid, do you want to chime in there? Um, yeah, I guess like the little nugget of insight I would add is we've, I mean, as a protocol, we've noticed that there is a certain subclass of investor who will always, um, prefer to have like immediate exit liquidity 24 7 365 um and i think potentially with these like liquid staking assets there will be like some subset of investors that never does convert i think nick's right that it will get to a pretty high percentage of all the assets on chain but there will always be a group that worries about for whatever reason smart contract hacks something unknown we haven't seen yet causing that asset that that price to like depeg mm -hmm from the regular asset. I mean, we saw this with staked ETH a little bit back in Q3 this year. Um, but I think be because of that, there's a, just a subclass of investors who doesn't think the additional like five to 7% uh, you get a year for these assets is gonna be worth it. Um, yeah, that's just kind of my little two cents from what we've seen in Aperture with some of the whales we work with. I think it's a, it's a completely reasonable <clears throat> fear. I mean, at least right now where we're still kind of early on, we saw uh, Stater BNB recently have a massive DPEG, not even because of anything that happened to Stater. It was because of what happened to Anchor, A-N-K-R's uh, liquid stake derivative, which I think is like A, B, and B, C. So uh, the fallout from, like if you were, let's say using B and B, X as collateral, you may have been liquidated, not by virtue of anything that, that was the fault of Stater. So, you know, while we still have relatively low liquidity for these assets, while these assets are still sort of, finding their place in the space. By the way, it, it totally repegged. Um, anyone who played that arbitrage could have made, you know, ridiculous amounts of, of money. Uh, but there was a time that had you been levered up with that, you could have been liquidated. So there are, there are certainly additional risks that that many investors with low risk profiles would not want to uh, jump in on that and uh, definitely understand that. However, with higher liquidity, with more adoption, these risks get mitigated. And, um, you know, we'll see. I, I think as Mara said, composability is key. As Mark, do you want to jump in there? I saw you unmute yourself. Oh yeah, no, I just wanted to kind of uh, continue on that thought you had, Stephen. And you know, I mean, we, we've seen um, a few of these exploits. You know, there was the anchor one, as you mentioned, and also the stater near one, uh, where these liquid staking derivative protocols were exploited. Um, but but so far, you know, knock on wood, uh, what we have seen is that. Uh, the receipt token is exploited in some way, oftentimes with a you know an excessive amount of minting of the of the um, you know the liquid staking derivative, and then you know that loses its peg completely, goes to zero, whatever it is. But then the actual assets themselves, the actual like tokens that are staked natively on chain, are still there. And so we've seen you know only a handful of exploits, but fortunately so far all of those exploits have been recoverable, where the protocol themselves were able to reimburse or cover the expenses. Uh, relating to to those exploits uh, for the people that were actually liquid staking themselves, but also for people affected maybe in a secondary way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's super interesting. There was also an interesting question here about layer twos, um, and and I think that's also going to be you know a narrative going into twenty twenty three is like how many layer one blockchains or how many layer twos do we need, you know, and, and kind of what is going to be the ways that they can differentiate between themselves. Um, I think that's going to be, you know, super interesting. I think ETH obviously has uh, the, the, the throne in terms of like having the highest quality protocols, having the best security. Um, but how does BSC, how does Avalanche, how does Arbitrum, Optimism, Phantom, fill in the blank, or one or layer two, differentiate itself and find its, you know, product market fit. Um, I think we're starting to see that maybe a little bit with with Arbitrum, you know, and having uh, leverage trading and different, uh, you know, uh, there's there's perps, there's options coming, there's all sorts of stuff. I think that that's maybe one way we're kind of starting to see this differentiation. Um, maybe other ones will focus more on NFTs or more 
on gaming, you know, and we are already kind of seeing these uh, even L2s that are going to be specialized for certain things. So I think, you know, that's going to be an, a super interesting narrative as well. And, and to see when a lot of these foundations, which still have, you know, a lot of uh, money in their treasuries or in their community pools, you know, start uh, um, being willing to kind of incentivize again, um, yeah. different activities on chain. Uh, so I think that'll be another interesting narrative to watch over the next you know, 12 to 18 months. Absolutely. And actually, I think it'll go ahead. Go ahead. Aperture. Yeah. I mean, David, I was just, I, I was, <laughs> I was gonna say, I can give a little more color there. Um, in Aperture, we have new strategy vaults coming up that are not going to be on Avalanche. Um, and for the first time, we've actually been able to pick the chain. The new strategy will be launched on. We're not like beholden to a specific protocol on a specific chain. And so within that process, we've, given a lot of thought to these you know alt l1 narratives and what aperture has kind of come to decide is that the low liquidity and the risk of the chain just like failing or becoming irrelevant in the next like five years are too high for us to justify not doing ethereum or not doing arbitrum or optimism um so that's basically kind of what our decision making framework looked like. So the next vault we build will almost certainly be on Ethereum mainnet or one of the the L2 scaling solutions. Um just because the you know we've gotten burned by Terra and the same thing could happen to Aptos or even Avalanche, which is a great chain, could, you know, just be less competitive five to ten years from now compared to um Ethereum, which seems like most people in, in most DeFi protocols would say, you know, that is obviously the best bet of a chain that's going to be around in five to 10 years. Um, and you kind of want to plan on a longer horizon, especially when we're looking at, we need another, another couple of years before we're back into a bull market. And obviously if you want to have a successful token launch that, you know, it, it's not something that just dumps immediately, but something that accrues value slowly over time, including up to like a decade from now, um, then you want to really be picking the safest ecosystem that has the, the best shot at surviving. So you're not compounding a risk because doing anything in DeFi is already risky, even if you're on a safe chain. So I want to take that conversation and, and pivot a little bit into some of the L1s that we've seen sort of fall out of favor. Now, I'm not a Solana apologist by any means, but I have really appreciated the, the Solana de developers that I've met and you know the speed of Solana. Uh, but right now Solana's in a bad way. What do you guys think about let's let's start with Solana um, as an L1 and its potential future? We'll start with you, Nick, uh, since um, we haven't had you speaking well. No, for sure. And somebody in the chat mentioned I was talking too fast. I get that a lot. I apologize. <laughs> I will slow down. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so Solana itself, I have never, you know, to be completely transparent, I, I want to make sure everyone's aware of my potential bias. I have never really been a huge advocator uh, for the Solana ecosystem. Um, and it's not really a matter of centralization. Um, I think when you think of crypto, centralization is a spectrum and different things have different use cases. And so I think Solana uh, could essentially serve certain product market fit or serve certain use cases, right? So um, it's not really a, a hatred towards the this uh, concept of, you know, is Solana centralization or not. But I think when you look at the chain, I think a lot of people were turned off in terms of DeFi natives, particularly because of the way that those projects uh, conducted themselves, uh, specifically uh, the tokenomics releases, um, often uh, very uh, low supply. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, didn't really appreciate that. And that's why you never really saw Solana DeFi kind of take off. I think if you even look at Solana now, one of the biggest problems is um, it's TVL adoption, right? It's at just a measly 250 million uh, below chains that people might not have even heard of before. And so I do think they do have a future. I do think they have a ton of capital and a ton of VC backing, um, but they're definitely going to have to change the stigma and narrative around their ecosystem. Um, specifically, you know, again, Radium, another protocol just got hacked. And then, of course, we saw the big uh, reporting article of the speculation of those uh, developers that were maybe anonymous behind, you know, 10 different projects that have maybe moved on to other L1s now. Uh, so I, I think Solana, again, still has a future. I think it's great tech, but it's it's got to spin the narrative. It's got to find a different use case other than NFTs or something like that. 
You know what? I, I, that's a really good take. Uh, do you want, yeah, go ahead, Mara. You know, I, I, I also uh, <laughs> was never a big proponent of Solana. I, th- I think for some similar reasons that was just stated there. I, you know, I, just one more maybe potential bearish side to Solana as well as we still have just such huge overhangs. You know, like the, there's so much supply of the token that's, you know, out there and, and uncertain term, in terms of like, whether it will have to be sold in the future due to, you know, uh, potential issues to FTX or other kind of institutional players. Um, but I also completely agree that, you know, like they do have um, some pretty interesting things going on over there and they have, you know, a lot of people that really uh, believe in, in, in the tech and believe in the product and a lot of money behind it. So I wouldn't count them out. Um, but but I also just had a quick question for, for McDavid. Um, you know, I think that that perspective of like, being a protocol and trying to decide where to build, I think is super interesting. And, and, I, and I heard you mention ETH and the all twos, um, you know, and, and I'm kind of, I guess, curious to hear more about the selection process between going uh, to ETH mainnet or going to an L2. Um, you know, I think that like the L2s are quite strong because they, they kind of uh, piggyback onto the security of ETH, but there still are, you know, some some uh, security concerns related to having to bridge assets over. Um, I know that a lot of the bridges, like the native bridges, especially for Armstrong, for Optimism, for other ones, you know, are safer because they have relatively long uh, periods, bet- you know, between withdrawing from the L2 back to the L1 and stuff like that. But I'm just curious to hear kind of about that thought process of L1 versus L2. Yeah, I mean, within Aperture, it's been pretty simple. It's like, is the strategy we're building going to have high gas and, and or lots of transactions involved? If yes, then we're going to lean towards the L2s. But if it's something that's um, relatively low gas and lower on the transaction side, then we would just put it on Ethereum mainnet. There, there's no point in uh, deal. Well, another consideration too with the, the L2s right now is like we do think about people on ramping into say Arbitrum and like right now, like Coinbase doesn't support that. And that's kind of like a, an important on ramp for, you know, probably the most important market still in DeFi, which is the U S um, I think Binance U S you can, you can on ramp into Arbitrum directly. Um, and of course like sophisticated whales and, and like institutions are, are going to have issues with that. But we do, we do think about that kind of like uh, conversion funnel stuff where, People might be less retail in particular might be less familiar getting into Arbitrum versus Ethereum mainnet, vice versa. Um, and then quick comment on Solana. Uh, as many of you know, like after after the, the Terra DPEG, um, we were doing like a lot of soul searching on the next strategy to build. And we actually started building um, a version of the vault we have now on Solana in tandem with the Avalanche development. We had like a, one team working on basically like a, a tulip based PDN, um, as well as the, the Alpha Mora Avalanche based PDN vault that we built. And just a little bit of perspective, like those teams spent like the same amount of time, like, you know, let's call it basically about three months. And we were able to finish the Avalanche contract and all that stuff, like the front end development as well. But the Solana contract hadn't even gotten finished. There was like still so much stuff we would have to do to actually launch it. Um, so that's just kind of like a real world example of how this sort of, it's difficult to develop on Solana narrative that you hear all the time. Um, and that's definitely still an issue. I mean, Solana has some amazing developers uh, as Steven's called out. I, I totally agree with that, but it, it's still friction for new people entering the space or, or protocols that are pretty chain agnostic and, and build stuff here and there. Um, getting into Solana will always have kind of an upfront like plus 50% development time to do anything. Yeah, right now you, you having friction towards developers towards new protocols is uh, can can seem to be a, a chain killer, um, and yeah, I think Solana is rust. Uh, Cam thirty three SS is asking. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on from <laughs> from the uh, potentially bearish narratives surrounding Solana and to the more I don't want to say bullish narratives, more hopeful narratives. So we've mentioned the ETH L twos as being uh, these sort of hopeful competitors for the future of Aperture, and we're going to get to Aperture in just a second here, probably uh, around. Uh, Four minutes from here but before then what aside from the eth l2s which other l1s or maybe not l1s 
Uh, are you guys thinking we'll have strong narratives moving forward, whether it be something like Aptos or the, the IBC? Uh, what, what do you think the future of DeFi is aside from, you know, ETH and its L2s? Uh, sure. I guess I can start. Uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, I, I am particularly interested in Sui and Aptos. I did have a chance to sit down with like the head en engineering and a couple of the executive team from Mistin Labs, which runs the Sui blockchain. And it seems like they uh, really have a lot of promising things going over there. Um, they definitely have tons of runway specifically to, you know, continue to build through this bear market. Um, and, and it's very cool to see them, you know, take their efforts, which were once at Meta and you know, kind of spin them off and, uh, you know, try to pursue their own kind of journey here. So I'm definitely kind of, you know, keep an eye out, not necessarily endorsing, you know, the, you know, tokens or anything like that. I'm much more interested to see um, what kind of adoption they can drive through this bear market. Um, and then I guess one other chain I, I guess I might be interested in would be uh, honestly coming, kind of taking a second look at Phantom. You know, at one point, I'll be honest, I, I kind of writ off Phantom uh, after, you know, the 2022 wasn't such a good year for them, but seeing Andre Conrad's article and, you know, what he's done to boost their treasury and their runway. And, you know, they have this enormous war chest. So I'll just kind of be keeping an eye on things, seeing if, the, you know, they're able to, you know, attract any new talent and, you know, build anything new things out that, you know, maybe it's worth, uh, you know, bridging back over. So. I would love to hear, uh, Mar, if you're still there, I'd love to hear your take on his take. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I have some similar feelings as well. Like, and I think that, um, you know, I think things were quite bearish there for a while with Phantom. I think that they uh, made some difficult decisions when it came to how they were uh, incentivizing protocols to be on the on the chain. Um, you know, and I think that there was some difficulties with communication. But I think it's it. You know, it has been interesting to see Andre come back, and I think, you know, quite impressive, honestly, to see how successful they have been at their treasury management and kind of. Um, you know, building that over time and, and building the runway, which I think could be, you know, an issue if we're looking at a project, you know, needing to sustain itself for, you know, multiple years or even longer than that. Um, and, and, and of course, I'm also, you know, very bullish uh, Cosmos in general. I think that, you know, I we, we've kind of already talked a bit about the ETH bull case. And I think that to me, Cosmos is a really strong alternative, especially since it is just so fundamentally different. Um, you know, instead of having one main chain, which everything is built on top of, you know, so whether that be protocols themselves or, or L2s, um, you know, it's having this kind of interconnected web of, uh, you know, of, of sovereign blockchains and each having kind of their own specific purpose um, and being built for, for specific things like, you know, um, there is Stay, which is going to be built and, and that's going to be specifically you know, for, for having really high transaction speeds um, so that, you know, certain protocols that need that can be built on top of it. Um, we've seen other protocols as well, like Kujira, who has a specific purpose. And so you can kind of really fine tune, uh, you know, just the the underlying structure of the blockchain itself to fit kind of the, the need and the demand. I would say, I think it's been not nearly as tested as or, or, or like shown to be, um, you know, effective as something like ETH mainnet. So there's still, I think, a big question mark of it, but I but I do think that as kind of an overall thesis, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the great parts is that the Cosmos building community is just so strong and a lot of that infrastructure that's needed, like IBC, you know, and, and a lot of the other new improvements that are coming as well, like um, interchain communication and, and, and other things as well as um, either already in place or, or you know, is fast in the works. And, and you know, this is kind of a bit of a meme, but, you know, Cosmos is <laughs> one of the only chains that has, uh, you know, finished their their roadmap, so to speak. Um, you know, so I think that they have a proven track record and kind of like defining where they want to go and actually being able to to achieve that to a certain degree. We could certainly uh, yeah, okay. wax lyrical about Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, that's actually just, uh, if we could piggyback off that one more, i just ask you one more question. Um, what what do you do you have any thoughts on the rejection of the the two point proposal and maybe your your thoughts on how you know the cosmos ecosystem will move forward? Oh, I guess I was. Sorry, I didn't realize. But... Yep, sorry, I didn't realize I muted myself there. Um, yeah, no, I, I I think that you know in, in a lot of ways, um, decentralization and governance. I mean, it's 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 core ideas, which I think you know as as you 
said earlier, are fundamental to the you know DeFi and crypto ethos. And so I think they're really important. But I think at the same time, uh, it's incredibly difficult to make a decision with a lot of people, something that you know affects their bottom line. You know, so I, I can understand uh, you know why um, the 2.0 proposal you know didn't get passed. There's you know people that have a lot of different opinions, and I think one of the unfortunate things was that um it was kind of communicated as being although it was just a signaling proposal essentially meaning that you know people were going to uh you know vote on something and kind of say notionally that they like the idea and then you know the development could move forward on it um with different kind of formal votes happening in the future i think it got uh politicized in, in a lot of ways um just within kind of the cosmos community itself which can be very negative sometimes and i think you know it's it's kind of uh maybe you know a strength but also weakness at the same time so as far as i know and, and, and i am in contact with a lot of different protocols in cosmos a lot of people that are building i think you know the 2.0 not passing i think may slow things down slightly um but it also might you know give the community time to really kind of think about what is important and, and come up with a new proposal uh you know that will be able to bring people together instead of um dividing them um, so, so, you know, I still think that, uh, the core components of 2.0 is still going to move forward and continue. I think it won't maybe happen quite as rapidly. The things that, that kind of worry me is that, you know, like one of the big announcements, me and Steven were at Cosmoverse together, uh, earlier this year. And we heard about all these exciting things like native USDC on, on Atom and, um, Lido launching on Atom and, and other things as well. And I think those type of things that are the bullish catalysts that Adam really needs to see kind of more adoption and more functionality, like having degree slowed down. Um, but that's, you know, just to be clear, that's only specifically for the Cosmos hub, um, you know, and, and I think that like, uh, you know, there needs to be more clear decision-making and, and agreement in terms of like what the future for that is. Uh, and, and, you know, while the, that decision making is happening all across the the you know cosmos ecosystem whether that be on juno or say or kujira or osmosis you know development is happening and progress is is moving forward um so i think you know um i i'm i'm still very bullish on cosmos in the long term and i think that you know it is a, a different outlook on how blockchain should work and i think one that that you know for someone who maybe already has a lot of exposure to ethereum it is an interesting way to hedge, you know, or to kind of uh, have a, a second thesis um, in the way that they're looking at the future of, of the space. No, thank you. Thanks. So thanks so much for sharing that. Man, there, there's so much that we could talk about with, uh, with Cosmos. Just particularly, I mean, we could probably do a whole hour just on the community of Cosmos and how the community itself has an effect on the ecosystem but i do want to get to to aperture so thank you guys for for your takes uh mcdavid let let the alpha rip uh, what do you have for us what do you want to announce um yeah basically we uh started doing some back testing into a uniswap v3 based uh automatically rebalancing vault um to see like if the like based on the model aperture the rebalancing model that actually thinks makes the most sense. Um, what would the yield look like? And just like run that like a real world simulation as if that vault had been live for the past like three to six months. Um, and the preliminary results we've gotten so far have been really positive. Um, and I would say one exciting thing about this is these vaults. Tell, are us, the numbers. Tell us the numbers. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have, I would say the numbers are comparable with, the ex the better pangolin vaults we have that are live right yeah. now um and the caveat to that is those pangolin vaults are highly based on png like the farm reward token right. um whereas these uniswap v3 based vaults would be 100 percent real swap yield fees. it's just the swap fees yes um so that's pretty exciting um we'll, we'll do a medium post to, to kind of share more of what the back test revealed so be on the lookout for that. But um, that's a strategy we're really excited about because it's A, real yield, and B, um, the liquidity is so deep on these Uniswap V3 pools that you can really, really scale up the strategy. Whereas 
Um, like currently the, the vaults we have on, on Avalanche are kind of bottlenecked by Iron Bank borrow supply, which is unfortunate, but um, that's something we, we could we could mitigate with uh, a Uniswap B3 based PDN. Okay, so <clears throat> so I have so many questions uh, in so little time. You're saying Uniswap, Uniswap V3 PDN vault. Now we've seen um, concentrated liquidity, automatic rebalancing from a few protocols. I mean, you know, we talked about Solana earlier. We have Camino, uh, and there was another one, Nazare, that was also doing it. We also saw um, what's the one on mainnet? I can't can't think of the name right now. Uh, if you think of it, you can put it in the chat. But you're not just doing that. So you're not just doing a rebalancing Uniswap V3 vault. You're also doing it as pseudo delta neutral. So is this to imply that your initial fiat denomination should be, you know, more or less what you get then plus yield? Wait, can you repeat that last question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so it, it's a PDN vault. So does this mean that like, let's say you, you enter in, in like an ETH USDC vault and the total fiat value of that initial entry is let's say ten thousand uh, dollars would you assume then that that's going to be roughly unaffected it's pdn so there's still impermanent loss that's not you know dn but is is that the goal and the aim and then to have then have yield on top of that initial or is it going to be like just a rebalancing of a of a lp of a concentrated liquidity position i forgot to mention yeah th there's a this is a leverage th there's a leverage component to this okay well, man, that there's so much to dive into the mechanics there because uh, hedging concentrated liquidity seems like a monumental task. So uh, I am really excited about this now. Yeah, and I wish I, I wish I could like explain the mechanics of it better. Yeah. Um, this is an alpha leak, so I don't have the like fully it articulated uh, communications department way of sure, sure presenting the mechanics of this. But be on the lookout for that. We will do a full write up. Um, this is just, just like something I kind of saw in our uh, internal Slack that was was good news that I wanted to leak out here. Okay, so uh, when that's uh, that's always a question in people's minds. You have this potential PDN, maybe leveraged uh, auto rebalancing, concentrated liquidity vault. Um, what what do you guys have for a timeline? Do you, I mean I don't know how many how, how many things are well in place, but. Hard to say at this point because um, we have another structured product that's already slated to launch in Q1. Um, that's not in the like PDN space. Um, but for this fault, like the next steps, basically we this will get a code review to like make sure that the numbers we're getting, which are exciting, are in fact not based on some kind of fat thumb error in, in the code for the back test. Um, but then after that, we will also expand, uh, try out different pairs, try out different market conditions, try out different rebalancing parameters um, to scope out like what the full potential of this product can be and which like pairs and vaults and also which uh, Uniswap V3 based, uh, like which chain we should launch it on. Um, so we'll do like basically some more back testing essentially. And if that is like, if the results are extremely good there's the potential this could leapfrog the other vaults we're working on like if we're like oh my god this yield is materially better than that vault then we could flip flop the product roadmap but otherwise it would be something that would launch late q1 or q2 after this other vault is rolled out <clears throat> uh, i like the sound of that um Quite a bit, actually. So, one of I guess you know there there are so many questions that could be asked here. One of them is you if you have the tech to build a PDN leveraged V3 vault, that implies you may also have the tech just to do a rebalanced uh, V3 vault, potentially optimized for rebalancing. Would you release that as a standalone product that's not PDN for those who want potentially you know long or mixed exposure to LPs on V3? Yeah, that would definitely be on the table. I like things on the table. Um, okay, so that um, that kind of concludes this, but we do have a little bit more time. I know we started started late. So, uh, are there any comments from from Nick or Mara on this um, this reveal? 
by mute sir per no i i guess uh i just wanted to clarify one thing uh david was this going to then be it sounded like on um uh ethereum mainnet is that correct well that's that's like tbd okay. um i think the back test covered potentially a couple different uh of the chains that the uniswap v3 is deployed on but in terms of which one we would actually launch on there's like, there's like a couple factors that would go into that but we would generally we generally optimize for apy and tvl carrying capacity right so so then, this, go ahead. oh go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to mention, um, and then I, I believe with your back testing results, you mentioned that uh, you're going through them, right? You want to double check them. Do you, I guess, have any plans on making those public, or is that something that you would keep uh, internally? Yeah, like a portion of that, like the code wouldn't be made public, but the results is something I want to include in the medium write up. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, and thanks, Stephen. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so I was just saying that um, you mentioned L2s earlier. Uh, so, so to me, it seems like you know, optimistic Ethereum might be might be one of the natural candidates for this kind of uh, this kind of strategy. Maybe uh, Polygon because there's a lot of V3 activity over there. So this is exciting, um, wonderful. Mara, any last comments? Oh no, I was just you know echoing you guys that that it sounds very exciting, and I think you know once the tech is in place at, at Aperture, it sounds like something that can be incredibly scalable. You know, both within uh whatever version of uni the v3 that they're gonna put it on if it's on mainnet or if it's on arbitrum or you know wherever they they decide but but also you know going back to what you were saying about other people that are using that same concentrated liquidity technology whether it be for example quick swap on 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 polygon who has you know a similar setup and then is adding incentives on top of it it seems like you know once you guys have that in place you could move it all over and and have some really interesting strategies um across a number of different chains which would be which would be great so yeah i'm just excited to, to to read the medium uh mcdavid and and uh yeah please please share that with us whenever it's uh it's available and for sure if it's okay i did have one last question if that's okay uh Go ahead, yeah from mcdavid yeah so when you're uh looking at offering this you, you know i think you said q1 or q2 um is there any expectations that you can share like what initially would be offered? It, I, I assume like, um, there might be limitations of which pools you could uh, offer in this strategy. So, is there a certain uh, you know certain cr coins or cryptos that you're targeting for the initial release that you'd be able to share, or maybe just you can even share about like how you select that process? Uh, the the pairs we would start with like it would almost certainly be ETH USDC or ETH and other large stable coins. Um. Yeah, and that I I think, and, and I don't want to like I'm kind of guessing a little bit here. I didn't I've like not looked directly at Paychan, the co CTO who does all our smart contract work, who ran this back test analysis. I haven't like looked at his full logic and reasoning, but I suspect he is basing this on the need for it to scale pretty high. So he's going to look at the largest trading pairs that have tons of volume and lots of swap fees, um, as that's where we're going to be able to scale up all the most. Um, so yeah, it, it's almost certainly going to be like ETH and stablecoin pairs and maybe some other blue chip asset pairs like wrap Bitcoin, et cetera. <clears throat> That's really no, nice. great to hear. Thank you. The, the most sense. Uh, do we have, I, I'll give you guys five more minutes. Are there any questions from the audience for, for Aperture, for Nick, for myself, uh, even for Mara, if there, if there happen to be any? And if you do have a question, um, I've server muted a bunch of you guys. Uh, so please, like, either raise your hand or just type the question in the chat if you have any. Uh, conversely, uh, McDavid, if you want to publicly answer any of the questions that we saw earlier, I think we have Pixel. Um, yeah, Vlad, or do you want to go ahead and ask a question? We have uh, well, Vlad, and then we'll have Don Sylvester. Misclick, my dude. I'm sorry, misclick, but I do have a question on Twitter, but it was an unintentional misclick. I have like four screens open, so I'll ask okay. it later. Okay. All right. Uh, Don Sylvester, I don't know if you're, you're muted, but if you're not, you can, you can ask it out loud. Let's see. You, yep. You can go. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the AMA. It's, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, where do you kind of see the road ahead in terms of 
integrating with some other applications, especially when talking about um, like uni read three pools and uh, pseudo dental neutral on, on impermanent loss. Like, do you consider integrations with something like gamma swap viable or do you rather view them as some sort of competitor? I'm personally not super familiar with gamma swaps product, but I know there are one of the like smart contract engineers at Aperture has like talked about them quite frequently. I think maybe he personally uses them. Um, so I can't give you a specific answer for gamma swap, but in general, I mean, I do like head up partnerships at Aperture. And so our general uh, partnership criteria is that the partner we're working with, like if we're building on top of someone, um, it needs to be a fairly trustworthy protocol that has enough liquidity within it that it can scale. Um, and we also need to like directly meet with their team to understand like what their motivations are. Um, are they like a team that launched a token a year and a half ago and like made some money and now they're kind of like lazy and not that motivated. Therefore it's going to be hard to get them to like implement changes that are necessary or even just be generally collaborative. Um, or are they like a super sharp team that's like hungry and like really eager to to build partnerships like the Homora team has been with us? Um, if that's the case, then yeah, we'll, we'll go forward with the partnership. But generally, yeah, it's like a level of safety and trust. And then also like the scalability, the general liquidity within said protocol is usually quite important for Aperture being able to scale whatever strategy we're building alongside them on top of them. Nice, yeah. Thanks a lot for the answer. So Gamma Swap is essentially they I, I don't think they're live yet, if I remember correctly, but kind of the, the TLDR of what they do is they want to offer delta neutral or impermanent loss protected strategies on, on uni v free vaults by combining the concentrated liquidity with essentially like option strategies. So like regardless what happens if one asset drops or like the other rises you're not really affected by il uh right 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 okay i think i did read about this one um yeah that's interesting i, I don't know enough yet to like give you a educated comment on that but um that's de it's definitely an interesting protocol i know it's something we've been studying yeah and hopefully we'll actually have a chance to to get them in for an ama here soon so uh, maybe you could stop by doing that and uh, we could get you guys to to uh, communicate. But totally understand where you want, you know, a, a protocol of, of a certain type that that meets a certain uh, that meets a certain criteria. All right, guys, that is going to be it for for this call. Thank you. Uh, an incredible amount to McDavid for coming out. Uh, Mara as well. Uh, always love to have you here. And uh, and and Nick, Crypto with Nick. So. Remember, uh, Crypto with Nick did post his his social, so if you want to post them again, Nick, feel free. Um, and actually, if you have anything else to say, anything coming up, please let us know, uh, Nick. Uh, sorry, if I have anything else to... Oh, no, I, I don't know if I have anything else necessarily, but no, I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, the opportunity to spend this time with you all and, and chat and discuss DeFi, you know. Uh, personally, Steven, you know, I've been loving your content for a while, so definitely... Um, you know, excited to be here and uh you know I'll, I'll definitely be sticking around the dojo and you know would love to learn from you all so you know thanks again awesome well i also um up, up your permissions to uh to content creators and now you do have full run of the discord you can come and hang out with us in the uh in the premium section if you'd like oh yeah that's very much appreciated thank you all right guys that's it thank you so much for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day uh winners or airdrop airdrop ease will be announced in the future by mcdavid Steven, do the messages will they stay live yes after... yes all like, the messages will be available I... for you to scroll through okay sweet because i'm gonna yeah i need a few hours <laughs> okay. Awesome. okay absolutely all right bye guys <laughs>